I'm Philip Beither, the curator for performing arts here at the Walker Arts Center. And it is December 5th, uh, 2009. Um, I'm here uh, talking with Eric Friedlander, cellist, composer, uh, musician, who is um, about to perform this evening his work, Block, Ice, and Propane. Um, it's a piece that the Walker helped provide some commissioning support in the theatrical realization of the work. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to start, Eric, by just asking you about the origins of the project. When and how and why did you first start writing these tunes? I, I think it began um, when I, I first noticed that I had a proclivity with plucking the cello or pitzing, yeah. kind of, um, and uh, it, it be was kind of an untapped resource for me. I was feeling like, uh, I because I, we mentioned Myra Melford before we right. started recording this, we were, we had performed here once, and I had a memory of playing, there was a, always a couple of times during the evening when I would have a feature, and one time I decided, okay, today I'm going to do it, tonight I'm going to do it pits. And, just the response I got from everybody, even in the band, I got this feeling that there was something that I was doing that really reached. And I had this, uh, it seemed like I had a natural ability. And you hadn't been using pizzicato no. much at all. You know, the cello, I always felt like the, the voice is the bow. It's, that's the way, uh, you know, I, I think fortunately or unfortunately, the training you get is kind of, Pitts is, is maybe is, is maybe never covered really, except if you play some piece that has a difficult Pitts part, and then right. they really don't even know how to teach it. Um, and I always thought of the bow as like uh, that's the one I, that's the thing I got to figure out how to make this the improvising voice of the cello. How do I play? So I spent years and years trying to, you know, sound like an out tenor player or sound like some other instrument or you know. Um, and just ignoring pits, and then so I, I, I really wanted to do something plucking and pizzicato, and I began just as I usually do with the uh, you know staff paper and just experimenting, improvising on ideas, and uh, I was developing material and melodies and. Uh, and when you say staff paper, as you improvise a melody, you would then actually write it down as you work on something to see uh, yeah. right then and there. Yeah, if I thought it had legs, you know, if uh -huh. I thought it had some. Uh, something I wanted to come back to, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I, I realize now that um, it's dangerous to just assume that oh, it's good, I'll remember it. I really have to write it down because I, I'm surprised even now. Uh, some of the new pieces I'm playing tonight, I just discovered because I wrote it down, and I thought, oh my God, I'd completely forgotten about it. So writing it down is very important. <laughs> um, but I would so as things kind of took a, at least some kind of shape, I would write it down, and then. Um, as I began doing it, I realized that the melodies and the, the style that I was writing in had something to do with American roots music, had some kind of, kind of simplicity about it. And, um, and where do you think that came from? I mean, that uh, sort of stylistic, somewhat sort of shift for you? I'm not exactly sure. I was, I was trying to, you know, I had this in my ears, this ringing guitar sound, and uh, I think that's where it came from. I thought, this is possible on the cello, you know, mm. that I love that sound, and it is, it was my first instrument, it was what I started The guitar. On. Yeah, the guitar, and so uh, I had that in my ears, and I think um, to get that sound, you need open strings ringing, and uh, you know, th that's what a, a lot of folk music is about, is ringing open strings. There's not a lot of s super virtuoso s stopping of notes or hand positions. They play open chords and, you know, it's, and so you need that, those open strings, and I think that's where it partially began. In, uh, you mean that ringing, just even basic chord strumming you know, on a right, guitar, it gets right, that sound. Right, right, and, and it's only when you get into more fancy technical kinds of music where they're stopping it with their, fi with their fingers and, you know, upper positions. But, in, you know, when you're just thinking, I'm, I'm singing a song and I'm going to put across some beautiful lyrics, you're not getting so super complicated. And a lot of open strings ringing, that's that sound of, mm. uh, um, that I was after. And so I think that led me into it. And also, I, as that kind of music was being written, um, I started thinking about these memories that I had of 
just being on the road every summer when I was a kid. And so they, it kind of went from one to the other and back. So and it was th actually the sound of the music that you were drawn to at that moment that brought you back to that time as a teenager taking the road trips with your family. And, right, huh? right. And, um, because it was the uh, almost open-ended sort of open Vista American sound of the music you were playing that that reminded you of those years and those trips? I guess so. And, um, uh, you know, I, I haven't exactly figured it out, but that's what I, I think. And um, when, did it, when did you start collecting them as like, oh, maybe this could be a conceptual recording uh, with all these different pieces related to those memories? Um, well, I think after maybe three or four or five pieces began to take shape and um, I really wanted to do something very forthright and, and, and um, um, I didn't want to try to hide behind any kind of complexity. I wanted to do uh, something really beautiful and um, I felt like it was, it, it was right for me at that stage. And, um, and so, uh, not just not just because it served the memories of that time, but because this was something you wanted to try musically. I think it served the music that I was writing uh -huh. too. I, every time I would get too complex or write another section or think, you know, I think, well, let's strip this away and just see what I have, uh -huh. and then I'd strip it away, and you know, you know, it's strong enough. It's better this way. Let me not try to layer m more sections or more complicated turn turnarounds or. Um, and so uh, once I had a, a group of, you know, four or five pieces, then I knew this was, d then I, I, I consciously pursued it. You know, then I thought, you know what, what, what do I need to look at now? I, I go back to my uh, anthology of American folk music and start I looking, had read looking the, for inspiration. You the know? Harry Smith collection. Yeah, and try to say, well, what do these finger pickers do or what do the fiddle players do? And, and uh, that's where I got the idea of different tunings because, uh, you know, if you're dealing with open strings, you, you end up with only a few keys that you can play in. So I started, guitar players are forever detuning, and you know, like Joni Mitchell gets really wild. Um, and, uh, and so I thought, let me try that. And sometimes I would just tune the cello in an odd way, and it would just create an atmosphere that was, oh, well, you know, it was almost like the piece is written mm. already. I just have to give it a little shape. So you had not really experimented that much with alternate tunings for the cello. No. Do other do other cellists use use that much? I think uh, you know. I'm not sure. You know, the the famous uh, example of alternate tuning is not is only by necessity is Oscar Pettiford who tuned the cello like a bass because that's what he knew how to play. Mm. So he would. Tune the cello like a bass, and then, uh, then he, all of a sudden he was, you know, a virtuoso, right. pizzicato <laughs> cello player. Um, um, and and did, did you, at a point, as you started to collect songs and think that it might make a, a, a recording that that was all connected thematically, go back to your father's or y your own photographs of those road trips? to remind you even further uh, of the, those times? You know, it wasn't so much the pictures, it was more the memories of being on the road um, that, were, that were triggering this. Uh, the memories were more about just the feeling of being mile after mile, the highways, mm -hmm. the back roads, the camping, the kind of the feeling of passing through other people's lives and uh, being a little unit on the road. That's, mm. That was really what was, and it was, it was really my uh, co-producer, the guy who uh, helped me um, organize this into a, a final CD project and the live show as well, who was like, you know, there's got to be tons of pictures from this period, oh, really? you know, and, and I said, who yeah, is, but I don't, this Dick Connett. Oh, okay. oh yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Used and to be referred to as A. Leroy. A. Leroy, yeah. yeah. Composer and uh, And he's worked musician. in the theater quite a bit um, yeah. with dance companies and right. others. Was, do you think it was that orientation that kind of made him think about a visual component? Uh, Maybe, or, uh, yeah. He's, he's a very thorough thinker in general, so I think he, and you know, for me it was a little, I was very, uh, I didn't really want to go there because I felt like that's my father's career and that's his business and his name and I you really felt like I don't want it to be seen like I'm just trying to glom onto um, his coattails and so I was very much against it and so he would squeeze like, I think the first show we did, we had maybe like two pictures mm. that I would allow, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then, you know, gradually I, st I got, to, you know, I, th I, I think uh, it was just a matter of like people really like liking the music and also 
the, the project standing up on its own, and, and so uh, Do you more think, and more. I wonder, yeah, I mean, I, there's a long uh, list of musicians or, or um, children of, of famous artists who do everything they can to avoid uh, any, any similarities or, um, but in, in some ways, you live in very different worlds, Completely, he in the visual yeah. art world, you in the music world, yeah. and also now, after all the success you've had over 20 or 30 years, do you think it got to a point where you felt like, oh, now I'm, I'm comfortable in having a relationship artistically on a project with your father's photographs? Yeah, I think it was partially that and um, partially, it was definitely a, that, was, that I came to, but it was mm -hmm. also um, realizing that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a reach. They were really, they really do have something right. to do with this. Yeah. You know, I was there when he was taking some of these pictures and You're some in of these a I'm in <laughs> a lot of the pictures and they was they were on these trips that I'm talking about and the music is it's all it's all of a piece, you know, and so I felt like it wasn't like I was um, these pictures kind of landed from Mars on in this project. Uh, it, they, they had something to do with it. Yeah. And so um, um, it, it was it was realizing that and, and being kind of at peace with that that uh, allowed me to, to move forward on the kind of... And I, I guess also I've always been a little suspicious of kind of multimedia, like, you know, if the music isn't stealing, standing up by itself, right. all this other stuff is just window dressing, right. you know, and so, you know, but um, mm. I've, I've learned a lot. <laughs> well, I wondered about if, uh, w you know, um, you felt how you felt given your your career has really been about music only, and then mm -hmm. you have a theatrical or a visual con context that you're placing your music in. Um, do you ever feel that oh, I, I I wish people had more of a blank slate? I think sometimes you do give them a blank, and other times you let the visuals be very strong. Um, how did you, did you struggle with reaching that balance in the making of the piece and things? Yeah. Like? It was, um, it's just by experience, by performing it and seeing, uh, you know, what I realize is people really come to the music uh, sometimes with the visuals or through the visuals uh -huh. or they, and they affect one another. And also just um, realizing that, um, that the, the music is still, is, is still the heart of the, of the project. Right, and, um, right. Um, Hmm. There, uh, there was a point. I, I was reading an interview with uh, with your father, who was asked by another photographer about the relationship between photographs and memory, um, and that that um, many of us think of our memories getting kind of locked in by images that were from our history, and that becomes kind of the memory. And your your father was quoted as saying, "I don't think photography has anything had anything to do with memory. I don't think it has to do with personal memory." It is just what it is. It stops time. Um, but sometimes music will have a relationship to memory in a way that perhaps images don't. And I wondered if you felt that the combination of the music that really came out of those memories and the images that reflected an aspect of those moments combined to give a kind of richer feel of what, what, that, what, that, what those experiences were like. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's what I'm aiming at, I uh -huh. think. And um, um, sometimes I, f I, like I, I, I vetoed some pictures that I had p we kind of pulled together a whole bunch because I felt like maybe um, it'll be too much. It'll be a little saccharine if I'm playing this kind of music and I'm showing uh -huh. that image. But um, uh, I think my father is, is uh, you know, he, he doesn't like to, I mean, I think that's a good example of, he doesn't like to intellectualize about what he does. In fact, and he, he's avoided interviews most of his <laughs> career, yeah, right? and, and, uh, and uh, he's not super comfortable with the whole process. Yeah. And so um, I, I think it's, it's valid, it's totally a valid point that he makes. It's like stopping time, that's, that's uh, at its heart, that's right. what it's about. But. Um, um, you know, I, I think since I've done this show, I think about some of these pictures, and, and uh, um, they they definitely become etched hmm. a little bit in my. It's since, almost like since using it's them? like yeah, it's almost like the memories now were were by themselves before, and now they're getting all kind of attached and right. hinged and, yeah. and s swinging from these pictures a little <laughs> bit. Is it odd to see images of yourself at those ages? 
um, and have this relationship with them on stage in the age you are now and yourself yeah, 35 I, or 40 years ago. I think it is a little odd. Uh, it's almost like a separate person huh, a little bit. Right. You right. know, I think uh, it, it helps me um, think of it. It helps me do it, to perform the project if, I, if I'm not so uh, entwined, intertwined with those uh, right. pictures, you know. When did the story start to come in in your performing of the individual compositions? Um, I think once again I have to give credit to Dick Hannett because he was he, you know, uh, I, we were we were working ideas for notes for album right, notes, and sure. I was writing uh, memories, and I was thinking, well, this will have something to do with it. And he said, you know, some of these would be great live, and. Um, uh, uh, once again, you know, I was like, it's not the music, you know, and it, it's like... <laughs> had you spoken much in your own, when you're leading a band or doing solo concerts, had you yeah, talked to the audience? Bit, a little bit, yeah. You know, I've been more comfortable with that, but this was a bigger step, and, um, and uh, you know, once again, it was like really realizing that this, this could be part of, part of a per performance and, and, a, and a valid part of it, mm. you know. Um, uh, I, I, I look forward to it actually mm. now, and mm. it's taken a while to get that comfortable with it. But was it a um, process to find the right stories or the amount of text in relationship to the music and visuals, and to get that balance? Yeah, right? that it was finding the right stories, and it was also um, because I spend so much of my perform when I perform, it's really about finding something new in the moment, right? Mm. And this is this is more this is being scripted in it's a way set, that is it. was it, it's like I rebel against it right. so much, but I realize you know you, I, I you know I can't just be so free because I'm not like a stand-up comedian. Right. Or so. Actually, they're very scripted. They just yeah. make it look not scripted, but um, that that you know I whereas when I play. I can follow a dead end or a, a, a tangent line and end up somewhere, and I'm, I'm comfortable enough that I know I'm not going to. I'm not worried if I find myself out on some back end, back road somewhere, right? right? But if I'm talking to an audience and I'm playing around with the material of uh, of a story, then I'm not gifted enough to just like weave my way back. So right. I, it was it was important to kind of have discipline and kind of just tell it the way I learned it, and that was tricky. Uh -huh. That was tricky because, because I'm used to trying to make something new happen. I'm because that's the, sp the whole spirit of improvisation. Is exactly. If you've done it the same way before, it's almost not valid any longer. It's not only that, it, it, um, it takes you to a, 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 a place where you're, you're left. Uh, it's almost like you, you've, cut the, the, you've cut the umbilical cord. You've cut the feed, the, mm. the nourishment, the creative force, right? So if, if that's why I often don't want to listen to playback when I'm recording mm. a record, because you hear something you do, and you think, oh, that's good. So then you go do it again, but because right. you, you've gotten to that spot in kind of an artificial way, you just did it because you heard it, right? right. You didn't just think of it. And yeah. Then when you get to the end of the spot you liked, then, you, then you're stuck because right. you haven't gotten to there that point in an organic way. And um, so it's very... It's like yeah. so one of the fa famous jazz icons was asked about um, you know why why they weren't rehearsing um, before the, a, a big gig, and they said, well, you know, you miss the rehearsal, you miss you miss the magic, or, or you right. know, I mean, you, you, you sort of um, that it, it's about so much about in the moment that um, the process of just getting something good and then redoing it is besides the point. Kind right. Of, um, w right. Um, at some point, you invited. Well, actually, the Walker kind of came into the process around the time that you've been doing it uh, for a while. The, the recording was out, but you, we, I think you were interested and, and we were curious about, as well as several of our national partners, about whether there's additional th elements that you feel would help um, bring it to larger venues and round it out somewhat theatrically. And at that point, um, you invited Bill Morrison to be a collaborator right. in the piece. And uh, could right. you talk a little bit about him and Sh what sure. he brought to the project? Sure, I mean, I think, uh, to tie it in what we were just talking about, my, my approach to performing solo was to kind of draw on my whole repertoire all the time and mm -hmm. just freewheel it, kind of, you know, before I would go out, I'd sketch out a set and it would involve pieces from this record and this record and, and then, uh, you know, a couple of improvs and, you know, see where I was. And, um, you know, I was a little bit uh, 
that's even the show I would kind of feature the music from the most recent record and mm. then weave in some of the greatest hits from mm. previous records that I knew people liked and it was hard for me to just perform one record but um, I, I felt like it, it was part of a big learning pro process of this project was, you know, an audience likes to focus. They like right. the story, the focus, the, the honed, part, uh, honed kind yeah. of piece. And so Especially when we I were think thinking in about theatrical this, venue, you know, venues that are absolutely. used to kind of constructed pieces coming Right, in it's there. not a cafe, it's not a jazz right. club or something. Yeah. And, um, you know, like, yeah. So <clears throat> part of that when we all started talking about this idea, I felt like I needed somebody to help me fashion what it was going to be. And um, uh, Bill is somebody I see every year at a lunch that we have and mm. around Christmas time. Um, just as friends. Mutual friends, uh -huh. yeah. And I, you know, we, we just see each other basically once a year, maybe maybe twice. And um, so at this lunch uh, a couple of years back, I was talking about this. Would would he be interested in directing? And he said, Well, I don't know about directing, but I'm, I'd love to, I'd love to, you know, see the project and see what you guys, you know, right. what, what you're up to. That's right. As after you and I, we talked by phone, and we were both batting around. Yeah, ideas all these different and, names, uh, right? Yeah. And then you said you had had a conversation with Bill. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, the kind of magic part of it was that he. He had a kind of uh, a kindred spirit with this idea of being on the road, and and he had t um, uh, on his own done all these road movies that he thought, well, you know, these might work. And then so when we got together in Dartmouth, mm -hmm. part of the whole consortium of um, it was the sort of mini residency, the mini residency. Yeah. We he brought up all the films that he had that were kind of road, you know, uh, related, and then um, we worked with the slides and we. We, we edited down some of the slides and then we, I, I worked with the sequencing of the music and, and we would try different pieces mm -hmm. with him. He had some ideas and I had some ideas and over the two or three days we fashioned the show. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it tweaked it a little bit uh, again afterward, but um, this is basically what we came and up with. And you've been keeping it pretty much the same um, as you've Pretty much now, yeah. yeah you now. mentioned you might have a few newer pieces that you, or those new as of as of, that as of Dartmouth, uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. They were written in the spirit um, of the Black Eyes propane, and uh, and um, they. It's nice to bring new blood into yeah, it. I'm probably sure. going to do it again. Right, <laughs> right. It I'm sure it keeps you fresh yeah. with it all too. Yeah. Uh, speaking of stories, uh, do you mind just explaining the title uh, of, of this? Oh yeah, recording? you know, it, at first it was called Black Ice. Let's see, Black Ice, Black Ice Tongue, B Black Ice Tongue in propane, <laughs> Black, and. Uh, <laughs> At the time, I was uh, working with a, uh, a, a guy who was running a label, and he, they were at the time interested in putting it on. He said, I, maybe we don't need the tongue. But they're all, it's all just related to being on the road in this camper, this very simple camper on top of a pickup truck. It must and have been Alec Venus. Yeah, it yeah. was Alec, yeah. right? <laughs> and uh, he, he, uh, we had an ice box, and um, I, don't, I don't even think they're around anymore, but you know, you buy block ice to keep things there cold. There was no mini fridge in there was your no, camper. It was a mini fridge, but it was a door right. with a drain yeah. inside. <laughs> and you put the block ice in there and you just kind of huddle, you know, all the food would kind of huddle around the block <laughs> ice. And you know, we had a propane stove in there and, um, and um, that's, uh, that was a big part of our life was pursuing ice hmm. every day, you know, because it would melt. Sure. And then, um, the propane stove was part of uh, mornings, and I, I, you know, I remember my mother had a lot of anxiety about the stove, about leaky gas, and I, I don't know, right, just right. so. Um, <laughs> so, and the tongue part was because my father used to make tongue all the time, and uh, it was a, a, a horrible memory. <laughs> Although I like it now, it was. Uh, you know, I was thinking about your father's work uh, as a photographer, and um, he so sort of. Um, resisted uh, any single category. He shot landscapes and, and self-portraits and uh, architecture and uh, urban settings and self-portraits and things. And you and your, in your world have also rejected a single category of you're not just a jazz musician or an experimental music artist or you know, you've, you've crossed into many genres. Um, do you think that that's in the DNA or uh, do you think that that Maybe. is? Uh, I think we're both a little impatient and a uh, little bit um, uh, short attention span, maybe. Um, um, you know, I was thinking about this too, and about the cello. There's something about the cello that's a little, it's not tethered to too many other kinds of music. Like violin has a lot of 
uh, leans on it in terms of you know jazz hot and and fusion and uh, you know um, fiddle music and there's a lot of when you hear or saxophone it's very tethered you know mm. like you hear sax you can't help I remember playing uh, with Courtney Love uh, and her band Hull and sh every time there was a clarinet player that was with us and every time he would just play one note he would go boop she'd swing her head around and go I hate jazz it was one <laughs> note I mean you know, how can you say one note is jazz you know and it was just like but there are associations and the cello is kind of you know it has the classical thing the, the box weeds sure. whatever but after that it's kind of on its own you know there's mm. not much so there, I think in a way it that was kind of always my thing. I, I should be allowed to follow my nose. I shouldn't mm. have to only play classical music. And that's, um, we're, we, somebody asked me about it today, um, you know, how I got into this other things. I mean, it's, it's just like it was this belief that I should be able to kind of do what I'm listening to. You know, mm -hmm. I'm listening on the radio. I should be able to play this music. I shouldn't have to so many classical players listen you know they they're listening to all sorts of music but they only play this and right that's cool but for me it wasn't cool mm -hmm. you know so i think uh, that's all you, part you of it. and you had said in your early years you know you, you you started playing guitar it sounds like you continued to play guitar yeah. in into your teens and were in bands and things like that yeah. and um, but uh, at what point did you start to um, I explore more adventurous musics i mean it sounds like you were trained classically mm -hmm. you had um, certainly the influences of, of our generation of rock and roll being part of right. one's upbringing, but in terms of more free improvisation, experimental musics, you, were par you became a real central figure in the downtown New yeah. York scene in the 80s and 90s and things. When, how did all that get started? Yeah, it's kind of a, it's a little bit lengthy, but I'll try to make it brief. I mean, <laughs> I, I basically went to see a uh, performance at a club called Fat Tuesdays in New York, which oh, sure. was around for a while. And uh, it was a Stan Getz uh, night. And he was trying out a kind of awful idea for him. It was like an electric band. And it, w it was, you know, he was crossing over. And right. It was Back when jazz was trying yes. to find a jazz rock band. Yeah, thing. exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and it wasn't hit. Not only was it a stretch, but it, for him to do it, it was. But they, we had great players. And one of the guys was Harvey Swartz, was a bass player. And I met Harvey at this club. And he said, you know, you play cello. I have a band. And he had been trying to use, at the time, a guy named Jesse Levy, who was the number one call, first call studio guy. So he wasn't really that free. Hmm. So and said, and had, you, had you been playing jazz at Never. that time? Uh -huh. Never. And so he said, you know, come by and to my loft. And oh, I Harvey like, Schwartz? Is yeah. He, did he collaborate with Sheila? Uh, Sheila Jordan. Jordan. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And uh, Harvey would like me to say, it's Swartz. It's oh, Swartz. So, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, and now Harvey S. Actually, he's uh -huh. gotten so fed up. With <laughs> <laughs> Mispronunciation. <laughs> and that he's now Harvey. Yeah. But so I fell in with, you know, Randy Brecker was playing trumpet and all these fantastic musicians. All of a sudden I was there with these incredible New York jazz players. I mean, just like cream of the crop, you know, um, maybe not as famous as Randy was, but all, you know, Harvey was playing and um, it was a quintet and the cello was the lead voice and I, it was just mind-blowing for me. It was a mind-blowing experience and here was Harvey writing his own music for his own band and we were performing and then we recorded a record and mm. that was kind of a, a pivotal experience mm. for me being in this thing and I was I was so under equipped for it. I was ill-equipped. I had no jazz tools. Were, were you comfortable improvising at that? No. Yeah. I was I was awful and um, you know we would carefully write out and I would learn solos in particular spots but and I you know I wanted so bad to do more but I I, I just didn't have the abilities and it's it, it takes some doing to I mean these were all kind of schooled in 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 jazz and bebop uh, these players uh. so it was that 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 was a fantastic experience and then I spent um, uh, it, this was part of my emerging as a, like just wanting to be a professional musician. And, um, uh, you know, and I spent my 20s relearning how to play classical cello mm -hmm. while I was also developing improvising chops and, you know, wanting to be busy, wanting to be a, a relevant player. That's kind of what I've always wanted to be uh -huh. relevant. Uh -huh. Relevant, you know, not to the times that, to you the were times that in. I was uh -huh. living in. Yeah. And you hadn't been keeping up with your classical playing. So no, much. no. And I, um, 
I, I, so I, I had to tear it all down and build it up again. Mm. And so by the time I was 30, I was incredibly busy, but um, not so happy because I was playing in you know the orchestra of St. Luke's and I was doing lots of studio work, but mm. I wasn't I didn't have my own creative outlet. So I started going back to playing creative music, and that l led me to playing with Dave Douglas and Marty Ehrlich and John Zorn and mm. going to the Knitting Factory and ah. doing all this stuff. You just started meeting those guys. And yeah, I started playing at the Knitting Factory in mm. different groups and then, you know, gradually, you, you know, has these things that right. do. Your name gets out and then people ask you to session and you come over and you do like so. Did you have a, did you know the work of um, other adventurous cellist of that time, people like Tom Cora, Arthur Russell. I did eventually. Or, you know, I didn't know so. Arthur so much, but I knew Tom and I, of course, Hank Roberts. I, sure, Hank Roberts. I had a, yeah, I mean, I had a lot of kind of eye-opening experiences when I saw Hank Roberts playing with Mark Feldman and, and Mark Dresser in Arcado at the, as a group at the time. There's another kind of just, oh, it's possible to play improvised string music and not, not, not be you know, you can be modern. You can be modern. It, right. can, it doesn't have to be jazz per se. It can be. It can. It can live its own life. You mm -hmm. know. And um, so. That. Yeah. You know. It's an interesting bridge because um, some of uh, what I, I wanted to ask you about before our time is out is uh, is about jazz today. And mm -hmm. um, I think some feel that uh, jazz as a term has um, perhaps you know narrowed the form of creative m improvised music in a way that um, hasn't served it. Uh, do, do, you, do you use jazz as a term to define your own parts of your own music? And do you consider yeah. yourself as part of an important lineage or really as outside and sort of innovating on, on the edge of, of that form? That's so complicated because, you know, there's, there's, it, it's complicated because of how people view jazz. There are people inside jazz who view it a particular way as something that needs to be protected and shielded and kind of like a hothouse flower, and then there are, are people who, who, like I think, who, you know, it, it, I mean, the way I feel at jazz is, is it, when I think of jazz, I still think of, you know, 60s, 50s, 60s, some of 70s music, and the way I look at jazz uh, is more a skill set mm -hmm. that I've learned mm -hmm. to, to then move ahead, and I, when I think move on, and when I think about all the great players, they were, at the time, they were ruffling people's feathers. It right. was it was about um, making people uncomfortable. It was like, this was not what's happening now with, right. with some of the approaches to jazz. It was like, um, and then eventually they were accepted. And, sure, you know, and now and, they're giants. And know, now they're great. giants, yeah. right? Uh, right. So, um, so I think there's that tradition that needs to be uh, cultivated and, and hmm kept going. Um, it's a really hard question. Um, um, I feel like all the years I spent working on jazz and jazz techniques, I feel, are, are, I feel like it's a toolbox that I can pull out mm. and, um, and use because I have this feeling for harmony and feeling for time that I think I would never have gotten if I hadn't learned these tools. You mm. know? And, they're, they're, they're there to be used for all, the, wherever it goes. And I think that's what's so fantastic about the downtown tradition is the, um, it's just using all these musics in a kind of responsible way, like really trying to, to, to find something creative and personal to say mm. and using, you know, uh, the way the 21st century, the crossroads of all the influences just passed through everywhere you right. are that, you know, yeah. um, you can't help but need to use them. Do you find that um, I, I, it's on my mind because um, it was, we had a wonderful date last month with uh, Owen Pallet, Final Fantasy, and the uh, Mountain Goats, and yeah. jo John, the leader of Mountain Goats, was was Darnio, yeah. with John Darnio. Yeah, yeah, it was saying how what a, obviously a huge fan he is of yours, and you've played on a number of their yeah. recordings. You've played with other people in the sort of alternative and indie rock worlds. Um, do you enjoy that part, being in that, that world as well? You or? know, and part of what I've learned is. Um, with doing all this is, and, and uh, sometimes when you're, when you are part of a jazz, even a fringe jazz position uh, tradition, there's a, a certain elitism you have about music, and like if you if you don't know all the techniques, and who are you? You're nobody. Right. But well, some things I've learned from working with John and other players is that it's it, at its heart, 
what we do is about expression. It's about expressing and reaching, communicating something. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's the king. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the pinnacle. If, if you're communicating something to an audience, they really get it. And um, it's not about, all, you know, if you can serve that with some of your technical mm -hmm. abilities, great. But right. um, it, you either have that or you don't. And, um, you know, I've been on stage with John and he's singing s songs and there are people in the front row singing them word for word with him. You know, right. they, sure. you know, and these are sometimes new records. They, they yeah. you know, it's <laughs> like he's, you know, and it's, it's, it's something about, um, music with words that's so mm. powerful that you, know, you can only uh, with uh, with instrumental music it's it's like it, it's it's such another level of abstraction right that it, it, it's almost frustrating huh. <laughs> even though uh, your 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 recording uh, black ice and propane has has been referenced as as almost like a wordless you know right a pop record or like yeah. a, it's it's tunes and it's yeah. uh, it, it just they don't happen to have words but it's interesting that 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 um, that you are one of these figures who's able to bridge all these words because you may be playing one night with the mountain goats and um, hundreds, if not you know, a few thousand people are there singing along yeah. with the songs, and a few nights later, being playing very naughty, very complex. Um, right. Some might define as um, I you know uh, difficult to access uh, work with Zorn or someone else. Right. And um, uh, but that's communicating as well to right. a, perhaps a different, maybe smaller audience. Right. But, right. And you still find enjoyment. Well, with Zorn, often this big audience. Yeah, it's big. <laughs> that's true. And when John has come here, it's, we've had uh, we've put him in the ten man concert hall. <laughs> but uh, but I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, but he's really. Uh, I, I mean, you know, he. You know, for for all his seriousness as an artist, which he really takes very seriously, and. Um, for for all of us in the scene, it's 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 so. I mean, we always like reality tests with John because John is just lives that life so purely. Right. Um, but he really is concerned with communicating something yeah. strongly, and it's and um, no matter what he's doing, it can be the most complicated, uh, you know, conceptually elaborate project. He when he's performing, it it really is about communicating, and I learned so much about that. You know, it's like. Yeah, we're going to take the set list seriously. Yeah, we're going to start so we hit them hard, so we get their attention. I mean, and there's such a beauty and soulfulness that comes through the Bar Kokhba yeah. um, uh, work you've done with them and with the String Absolutely. Trio, and uh, the, um, it's um, he's able to bridge those worlds as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, and even the classical music, which is very sometimes tough but also yeah, beautiful. Yeah. But even then, when we program, I can see how his mind is working. Like we do this, then we, you know, it's not just. Uh, you know, like this is where I'm at. Deal with it. I mean, there's an element of that, but he also will will shape it so right. that it's, you know, it, it takes the audience into mind. You know. You, you have a, a lot of bands that you've formed and, and a number that you have actively are playing with. Is there? Um, would you want to say anything about, say, Topaz or your current, uh, a very recent group, the, yeah, the, the Broken, Broken Arm, Arm Trio? Trio. Yeah. Uh, I'm working with that one. Most actively, right? Yeah, now? with the with well, solo and and the trio, and and that's a project I is you know part of my cello lineage tradition. Looking back at at uh, um, what the cello has done, it does not a very uh, you know it's not a very admir you know it's not so much in the improv jazz world. But one of the um, stellar moments was when Oscar Pettiford picked up the cello and um, uh, tuned it like uh, tuned it like a bass, but still he. And he broke his arm. It was he, why he yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. The whole story is he broke his arm playing with the Woody Herman band, uh, huh. playing softball with the Woody Herman <laughs> band. And the story uh, goes that he couldn't really drag his bass around so much that, but he had a cello a friend had lent him, so he tuned it up like a bass, and you know he he loved it so much. He, you know he named his son cello, cello oh, Pettiford. No. Yeah, huh. and there's a, a famous record called My Little Cello, and it's a picture of him with his son on it, and. Um, Huh. Um, that's a legacy. So uh, that, that, that trio is kind of uh, it's a tribute. honors him. Yeah, yeah, it's a tribute to this music because he, there were, there were a few bass players who kind of paternalistically picked up the cello and made jokey records like goofy songs with cello and like cello again. Uh, and yeah, so, you know, right. it's like that. And, it, and they're, mostly they're not so great. But right. Pettiford, and Pettiford did some of this because, you know, 
you got to do a little showtime, I guess. Right. But he also did some really serious music, and he wrote. He had a band around him. He designed a band around the mm. cello, and um, uh, this special record, My Little Cello, is you know with Julius Watkins and uh, some really stellar players. And he wrote and arranged music for as centered around the cello as the lead instrument. Mm. So that that's kind of a big deal for me because mm. I look back and there's not too many examples of that. Yeah. Well, I have a la last couple of questions for you. Um, one is a is a open ended question, but then we're going to move into a um, a, sh a short answer question a series of uh, where you can just give like you know a few word responses or uh, it's yeah, a like actor studio. Yes, right, well, it's a it's a thing we've <laughs> called eight ball uh, at, no. at, on our magazine, and so ball. someone asked me to to, to run ball. by a series of quick questions for you that uh, that if and if you don't have a quick yes. answer, don't worry about it. We'll move on to the next one. But the uh, I guess the last question I had was a back a little bit on your on the block ice and propane and and your father's work as a photographer and. I meant to ask you: Did did you find that as growing up in um, the home of a of a visual artist, um, any aspects of the forms in which he was working in, um, or the exploration of th those worlds and his his relationship with other major artists like Jim Dine and others, you know, that that there were aspects of visual art practice or artistic movements that you th think now, looking back, have influenced your 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 work as a musician. Um, well, you know, um, being around my house, b besides the fact that the walls are covered with lots of visual art oh, really? from all yeah. from all over uh -huh. different places, okay. friends gave him things. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and you know, he has lots of pictures and um, different kinds of art, and you know, um, but besides that, it was like being living with a you know a plumber or something. I mean, you know, he just he get up at four or five in the morning, go to work. Uh, besides the fact he didn't leave the house, he would just go down into the dark room and work until, you know, 11, then mm. come up, have lunch, go back down for another couple hours, and then that was, that's mm. the day, and then, or maybe go out and work and, you know, mow the lawn or whatever. But, um, so, uh, the only thing I would say is that I, I seem, and I, I want to do more of this, I seem to have a, an affinity for music with picture. I do like, mm. Scoring. I do some. I've done some ads. I've done some. Uh, s I haven't pursued this, but I do want to. I feel like I have an affinity for m images and mm. music together. So I mm. want to explore that. Both in an art world as well as in a commercial context. Uh, you think? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I yeah. think so. I, right. I, in any way. You're right. Yeah. 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 Um, well, are you ready for some short I'm ready. questions? I'm ready. Okay. Um, <laughs> the eight ball. I what have that. you been obsessing about lately? <laughs> Uh, Korean music, Sanjo. <laughs> Great. Uh, what was your worst gig ever? Playing uh, at Croissant and Company for about four hours in New York. It was a um, well, it was a croissant store with like <laughs> tile floors, and and nobody knew what the hell I was doing there. But were I you playing solo? Playing fifty. Yeah, I made fifty bucks. I played uh, <laughs> solo. It was about thirty-five years ago or something. <laughs> I guess this would be in, 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 other than the job you're doing now. If you had to take another job uh, or another career, wh wh what do you think you you would have liked to have done? I'm drawing a blank on that. Okay. Well, is there? Do you have a favorite poet? And I, of course, I'm thinking of your your recording Malador, but I figured you might answer in that direction. No, uh, John Berryman. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, is there a favorite passage of any of his uh, work? Yeah, but it, I'm. And you don't. Have I to used to know it, but I can't. I can't okay. remember it. It's the dream. There is. Um, I think he has a book called The Dream Songs. I'm pretty sure. Huh. Is there an artist as a teenager that you remember completely turning your world upside down? You know, a musician, um, um, visual artist, uh, other kind of artist, uh, filmmaker, or anything? I was so involved in pop music, I, I, I would get, you know, when I think back, uh, 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 even now when I play, sometimes I think of Carlos Santana, I still do. Huh. It's about his the emotional kind of playing that he does. Yeah. And, um, it, it was. I saw him many times when I was in high school and uh, played his records a lot. Huh. It's interesting. He's a figure too who was introduced, you know, to many people. Th you know, the recording he did on the Coltrane record and you know yeah. this and that. And uh, um, d d what do you consider the most overrated virtue? Oh, that's interesting. 
Well, I believe in technique, but I think t technical ability sometimes is overrated. Huh. Yeah. Um, is there anybody individually that, that I mean that you'd like to love to spend uh, three hours stuck in an elevator with? Uh, three hours, or an hour even, <laughs> <laughs> or someone fa someone that you'd really love to meet someday? Uh, well, I've met Wayne Shorter. I'd love to play with Wayne Shorter. I mean, huh. uh, or. Um, Um, the Black Eyed Peas. I'd love to be would play with the Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been listening to lately? Um, well, I, I do still listen to a heavy dose of pop music. Um, yeah. Taylor yeah. Swift, Black Eyed Peas, yeah. and, uh, and I'm I'm still I'm, as I mentioned the obsession. I'm listening to a lot of Korean uh, ah. Sanjo. Sanjo is a f form it's like a form of so solo instrument with drums. Oh, huh. Is there any way, thing you like to do particularly to unwind or relax after uh, working uh, long all day? Um, TiVo. <laughs> do you, this is a hard question. I hate if anybody would have asked me this, but <laughs> oh do you have God. a favorite recording of all time? Oh, it changes. Yeah. Uh, maybe, um. maybe at the moment, is there one? Oh, uh, the Chinatown soundtrack. Huh. Yeah, Jerry Goldsmith. I don't Chinatown. even know it. Wow. Incredible. Huh. Is there a uh, question you wished I had asked you that uh, you'd like to answer? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, Eric, thank you so much for thanks, the time. Doc. It's great Pleasure. to have you here. Yeah, it was yeah. fun. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.